morning or good evening, wherever you are in the world. I'm Judy MacArthur Clark, and I'm chair of the trustees of the Salisbury Foundation. And we're delighted to be part of this opening ceremony. On behalf of the foundation, I'd really like to congratulate AB, Lisa, and the One Health Platform for organizing this conference, this World One Health Conference in a virtual format. Now, as we all know, virtual presents challenges, and I'm sure we all regret that we can't be meeting face to face at this present time in Edinburgh. But virtual also has advantages, and it means that more colleagues from all over the world are able to join this conference and attend the various presentations and experience them. For those of you who are not familiar with the Salisbury Foundation, I'd like to say a little bit about us. We're named after Lord Salisbury, a, a famous pioneer in One Health, and we have two main activities. Our first main activity is to identify the most promising future leaders in One Health early in their careers and to award fellowships. Looking forward, and I'm looking forward to telling you more about these later. But our other key activity is to identify each year a senior leader in One Health and to in invite them to deliver the Salisbury Lecture. So my pleasure today is to introduce the fifth Salisbury Lecture, and it's to be presented by Dr. William Koresh, better known as Billy Koresh. Billy is Executive Vice President for Health and Policy with the EcoHealth Alliance in New York, and he also serves on the USAID Emerging Pandemic Threats Program, which is a very important body at this time. He has pioneered dozens, literally dozens, of initiatives around the world to focus resources and encourage linkages between public health bodies, agriculture agencies, and environmental health organizations. And personally, Billy has led One Health projects in over 45 countries, uh, truly an A to Z, uh, from Argentina to Zambia. There can be no one more suited in these current challenging times to deliver this 2020 Salisbury Lecture. So I'm delighted to invite Billy to present his lecture, which is entitled Global Diplomacy and Security, One Health in the 21st Century. Over to you, Billy. Thank you and the Salisbury Foundation for inviting me to provide the Salisbury Lecture this year. It's quite the honor and I really appreciate um, being asked and being given the opportunity. So today I wanted to introduce um, the Salisbury Lecture and we've heard about the organization. Of course, Lord Salisbury uh, was quite remarkable in his time as a One Health leader. I uh, was uh, both the president of the Royal Society for Veterinary Surgeons in the UK and then also for their equivalent Royal Society of Surgeons or Physicians in the UK. So it's a very unique individual and I'm very proud to be asked to be a part of the Salisbury name and the Salisbury tradition here today. I really wanted to talk about this link about emerging diseases and pandemics and health security. So we know, and most of you should know or be familiar with uh, the kind of what's going on behind pandemics and emerging diseases and where they come from. So we know there's different ways to approach this. And of course, traditionally, we can map out historically where emerging and disease events take place. This is over the last five decades there from uh, Kate Jones's work that came out uh, a while ago, a decade ago, of really mapping it. Um, but that's a, a retrospective look or looking in the rearview mirror. Um, what we can do is really look at what are the correlates or the drivers, or some people say risk factors for disease emergence in all of those events and start to put those into categories. And we start to get a clearer picture of what it is that's driving these events to happen. Um, what are the, cause, the root causes of them? And so I wanted to really kind of get into that so we can start to discuss the opportunities for prevention to reduce the risk of pandemics emerging or diseases emerging. Uh, so we really want to think about these categories. So there's lots of conversation. We all have our favorite reasons why diseases emerge and everybody's got a pet theory. But I do want us to kind of focus on what do the data say and what's an objective look at that. 
So we really see a large percentage. The bulk of these come from land use change, agricultural industry change. And of course, we're all familiar with how international trade and commerce has changed over the years. But what is that land use change? That's about deforestation, agricultural intensification, which actually links a little bit with the industry changes, but not completely, and habitat degradation. So if we take these factors, instead of looking at the diseases themselves, but take those factors and map out where are the risk factors in the world, we get this image of the hotspots of disease emergence. So areas that warrant more attention than other places on the planet, some are higher risk areas, some aren't. And that's because of what people are doing, what are those risk factors, and how those are spread out globally, where is it most likely for disease to emerge. Now, this kind of gets into this conversation about health security. So we've done some work to look at what are the functions under global health security? Um, you, we talk about prevent, detect, respond. I'd like to add recover too, because that's very important and it's circular. So we think of recovery as also building back to be able to prevent these events better. So we're really kind of a circular scope, even though right here on this slide is laid out, laid out um, vertically or horizontally, I guess horizontally is the one. But when we look at the functions under each of these, we can start to do a better evaluation of, are we doing a good job of prevention? Are we covering all the functions under prevention or detection or response that are necessary? Because we can't just have a piecemeal approach and then call it response or a piecemeal approach and call it detection. Uh, so we really have to have a comprehensive look. We can also use these to see where are the investments in this going and who's doing what. So when we take a look at kind of the global level, these are not national level, but global level programs about where they're putting the finances, where's the money going into these four pillars of global health security. We see that response, and not surprising to most of you, response is where most of the investments go. A very small bit of money goes into prevention and early detection and also in recovery. So we can start to see where the gaps of investment are and where we need to start strengthening programs. So I think the One Health approach really kind of drives us also into thinking about prevention, um, coordinated work for detection, and also collaborative and coordinated work for recovery. I kind of wanted to jump in just an example of what we're dealing with now with COVID-19 or the SARS-CoV-2 virus and kind of link that back to this thinking about prevention, early detection uh, before we get to the response. Because we'll hear a lot about what the world is doing to respond to the current pandemic. But we do know that work for the last few years has started to indicate that there's an immense and rich pool of related coronaviruses circulating in nature. And this is just a small part of it, but now we've identified close to 500 coronaviruses just in bats. There's a whole section of closely related coronaviruses to the SARS-CoV-2 and SARS-1 um, found in bats and in other animals. So we know this is going on, has been going on for millennia. It's been going on more recently for decades. And certainly in the past few years, we've seen a lot. So there's been some great work being done in China and Southeast Asia, and particularly in China, and looking at bats and uh, also with humans. So some early studies in bats started to show this rich pool of coronaviruses. The study uh, went on to start looking at bat roost and areas where these bats are living. So the the scientists working on this and the investigators started doing a more deep uh, dive into that information and then identifying at-risk human populations living around the areas that were where bats were positive for these related coronaviruses. What the findings is, and you notice down there in yellow, is that antibodies, this is you know, sero serology testing in humans, the antibodies to these closely related coronaviruses were quite prevalent, ranging from a half a percent of the population to 3% of the population prior to COVID-19. This is from two years ago. 
we're already showing antibodies to these, this group of viruses. So we know these viruses are getting into people. They're causing immune response. We don't know if it causes illnesses or not. Could be very mild. Could just be confused with the common cold or a mild respiratory disease, or maybe no signs at all, like we see with many people with COVID-19. But that really, that percentage you know, is equivalent to tens of thousands of people just in those areas. If we talk a broader look about the distribution, if we think of biologically about the distribution of those group of bats, the horseshoe bats across Southeast Asia, you see there's a very wide range. And we extrapolate that half a percent to two or three percent uh, seropositivity, we start to talk about three million, 10 million, maybe 20 million people are already serologically positive to this group of viruses. So we have pretty clear evidence that for quite some time, people have been exposed to these viruses coming from bats, for in this case, this example, um, and develop an immune response. So they are getting infected at some level and having this response. So it's not so surprising that every once in a while, we have one of these viruses changing in humans to become pandemic potential. It's not just, of course, humans that are at risk. When we look at some of the same viruses, uh, this is a se severe acute diarrheal syndrome of pigs, which is another coronavirus, with a group of bats that also host this virus. And this has been identified also in China by some great science done in China. But when we once again look at the Southeast Asia region and the distribution of those bats and the potential for infecting pigs um, by, those vi by these viruses from those bats, we see a very wide distribution and can kind of look at where the risk is for that. So once again, it gets us into this idea, we have this knowledge, we need to be moving upstream and thinking about prevention. What does that prevention mean? It's about education, it's about awareness, it's about improving biosafety, biosecurity on farms, so we can reduce the risk of these events occurring. For the general public, we need to do a better job in reaching out and communicating. So this is a one of the products from the PREDICT project, the USAID PREDICT project, about living safely among and with bats. And this has now been spread in Africa and Asia in different languages. And it really is a public outreach tool to teach people, give them the opportunity, provide them with the information they need to make safer decisions about what they're doing in their lives to protect themselves from some of these viruses. Could be washing their hands, avoiding contact with bats. So there are quite a few non-pharmaceutical interventions that we can do uh, that will reduce the risk of these emerging disease events and potentially pandemics. There's a lot of talk, of course, about wet markets and the wildlife trade. And if you remember back to my original pie chart, they do contribute uh, to a small percentage of what we know for emerging infectious diseases. They appear to be high risk. We know that hundreds of millions of people frequent these markets for their source of food. It's an amazing opportunity to improve, once again, biosafety and help people transition to safer ways to get their protein or their foodstuffs that they need to, make, to have a healthy life. Uh, the Australian government's done a very nice job in really breaking this out. And I refer this um, to you, and we can get this to you online. And this was courtesy of the Australian uh, Wildlife Health Network, and it's working with the Australian government to look at the wildlife, just the wildlife and wet markets and where are the potential areas for intervention and strategy. And we always have to have a good logical framework as we start to think about intervention strategies and preventions to see where we're most effective. This is not surprising to people that work in the food the world of food safety. You always choose your points of for, to be your most effective points of entry. And we can apply that to other uh, drivers of disease emergence or other risk factors. It's certainly not limited to food safety. Uh, one project we're starting to engage in now is in the private sector with looking at uh, cold storage and cold chain to provide alternatives to wet markets and live animal markets 
Uh, as you know, there's a complicated story, and there are many reasons why live animal markets are still necessary in many areas, but a transition to modern times, we don't feel like people have to stay in the 19th and the 20th century. Uh, we are now in the 21st century, and there's things we can do, one of which is there's some really exciting opportunities now with liquid natural gas when the regasification process, currently that cold energy is blown off into the environment and wasted. There are now facilities being built that capture that waste energy and use that for refrigeration. So there's no need for electricity. So there's a very low carbon footprint approach uh, to refrigeration and cooling. So I think coming forward, now we are in 2020, um, it's time to kind of rethink how we can expand some of these efforts and provide more people with safe access to food. So I just kind of wanted to close up my lecture here and remind us about what are some of these risk factors for disease emergence and get us thinking more about a One Health approach to prevention. And that means really engaging different sectors. If all we're going to do is wait to respond, that's the burden of the health sector, whether that's the animal health or the human health sector. We're stuck with cleaning up the mess from drivers or risk factors that are caused by other sectors of society. So an important part of this aspect of One Health is engaging in more disciplines, but really other dis uh, sectors of society on that prevention part of this framework of how these things occur. And just as a reminder, once again, what does that habitat and land use change really mean? If we look back th through the time that humans have domesticated animals, or we just look back over the last 10,000 years, a little graphic reminder, the planet, we know the planet's changed recently, but the planet has really changed by human domination. So if we look back to early days, 10,000 years ago, there were no domestic animals. 99% of the biomass of the planet of vertebrates were wildlife. If we look today, the biomass of wildlife are almost gone. It's down to about 1%. 32% of the vertebrate biomass on the planet is humans, and 67, 70% as livestock. So we really have to rethink what we're doing and readjust what we're doing and engage across the One Health spectrum and other sectors and bring them to the table if we're gonna do a good job about prevention. There's some interesting ways we can do that. And I'll just give you one or two examples. There's a response project funded now by USAID and they've traditionally done emergency response, earthquakes, tsunamis, floods, uh, but very little on the disease front there. And they typically work with the humanitarian aid community, which of course are very skilled in these responses. But this program called Ready is really getting the humanitarian aid community geared up to deal more with disease crises or disease disasters. So it's a really nice new way to think and a whole new community of people to engage to bring in and get them trained up, get them on board, understand to mesh with the health community more closely and do um, more effective and joint responses. Uh, some of that work has been like creating a dashboard. This was created in Bangladesh, where of course the traditional dashboard to look at a disease response would have all the human data. But in this One Health approach, what they're doing is blending in um, the data from OIE, the Wahis Wild Data. So the practitioners on the ground in Bangladesh not only are seeing the results in the human data on a daily or weekly basis, but they're kind of giving clues about the other sectors that are also at work. So this is really trying to kind of a opinion, it's a kind of an awareness raising. We're not yet sure how that might change outcomes, but we have to start first with bringing the groups together and making them aware of what each other are doing. So there's a really kind of opportunity to integrate in the environment and animals and wildlife, livestock into the human health thinking when they are doing a humanitarian response. We're calling that the One Health Surveillance from that project. At a country level, you can see how we can kind of link over time with the environment sector into the health sector. 
So this is an example from Zimbabwe, where they had a biodiversity strategy and action plan. And of course, then there's been assessments for disaster risk management systems there in the country. The joint external evaluation has come in, and now it's getting people to think about how those things are linked about how those could be starting to be linked together. They have an agricultural policy framework, and then a national adaptation plan and a roadmap that starts to bring these together. And then more, the, more recently, um, also this antimicrobial resistance is a One Health action plan there. So you can see how the parts start to come together at a national level, and it means that, um, but it only happens if we make the effort to interact and invite each other to these different workshops and meetings. So at a government or a national level, they see the teams, there's an interest and a willingness to be working together and what the product that flows out of that are more integrated approaches for preparedness, for prevention, for readiness to respond. Another great example has been WHO's effort with COVID-19 this year uh, with the R&D blueprint, really setting uh, research priorities. Right from the beginning, WHO is very open about inviting in the animal health sector, environment health sector into uh, participating in priority setting. So what's come out from this work from WHO is a very blended approach about priority setting and there's been now funding for both animal, environment, and human research related to COVID-19. Of course, a lot of that is response. We are in the middle of a pandemic, but they're already looking forward and starting to fund work into the prevention and a better understanding and better surveillance programs for the future. Now, those of you who've heard me speak at some of these meetings before know I really kind of like to talk about other people. And I want to always highlight somebody who's a kind of a, one of my wildlife health heroes. So this year, I really wanted to mention Dr. Uh, Christian Drosten. And as you can see, he's actually wearing a little mask with animals on there as a, as a doctor and a well-known uh, virologist. And he, this year, he got the officers across the Order of Merit from Germany, which is fabulous. But I'm just mentioning him here because in this year, what we experienced was a lot of confusion as this virus, as COVID-19, was getting out. And Dr. Drosten just jumped into the fray immediately as cases came up into Germany. And within a week, started sharing a PCR protocol for diagnostics. I know a lot of countries around the world, including the one I live in, was confused about what to do. Uh, but Dr. Drosten was not. And he made this information immediately publicly available. And I know many of you around the world started using that protocol immediately. Um, and I just see that as a really great approach and a great example for One Health. So Dr. Drosten, Christian, I just want to thank you and, and note you for that. And then to close, I think um, in the US and probably in Europe, there's this talk about the greatest generation. And it was really from the early 20th century and the world, you know, World War I, World War II, and then really coming out with you know, global peace. And all of those people, um, including uh, Lord Snowden, are older than me. I'm a little too young to have been in the greatest generation of the 20th century. And now I'm really too old to be in the greatest generation of the 21st century. So I'm stuck somewhere in between. But I do think all of you, we have this opportunity in the 21st century to create the next greatest generation. And I see that going on wherever I work around the world. There's a great team working on Rift Valley fever in livestock and humans and uh, adding in climate data and soil science and vegetation ecology and really working together kind of a one health approach. Um, so I'm looking to all of you to be our greatest generation of the 21st century. And you're now going to hear about a few of those individuals who've been honored and I won't use their names because I don't want to give the surprise, uh, but these are the Soulsby Fellows and you're going to hear more about those um, as soon as I wrap up and finish. I've been really honored to be at the beginning of this session and introduce a group of people that are going to lead us into the next century, a more healthy and a safer century, I hope. So thank you very much. Thanks for your attention and stand by. You're going to hear some great little presentations now.
uh, from the next greatest generation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Billy, for a truly inspirational lecture. You've demonstrated so effectively why a One Health approach is so critically important at times such as this. It's really an honour to have you deliver the fifth Salisbury Lecture and to kick off this conference with such a tour de force. Thank you again. And as you probably appreciate in the audience, the conference format doesn't allow for live questions at this point, but Billy is very happy to respond online to any questions colleagues place in the Q&A function. So please make use of that function. Now, I promised you earlier, I was going to tell you a little more about the Salisbury Foundation and particularly about Salisbury Fellowships. These are truly an incredible opportunity for those working in the field of One Health to get some funding for a project about which you're passionate, and at the same time to benefit from the accolade of being a Salisbury Fellow and joining what we call the Community of Fellows. In just two days' time, on 1st November, we will open our website for applications for 2021 fellowships. I want to encourage you to learn more by visiting our website at salisburyfoundation.org. But first, I want to invite Kate Salisbury Bullock, who is Lord Salisbury's daughter, to tell you about her father and his passion for One Health. After Kate speaks, you'll hear brief videos from five current Salisbury Fellows. Each will introduce himself, tell you a little about their project, and then say what it means to be a Salisbury Fellow from their perspective. So over to you, Kate. When I heard that the One World Conference had given me this opportunity to speak, I phoned the family in Cumbria to see if they had anything they'd like to say to the new Salisbury Fellows. Yes, was the emphatic reply. Lawson predicted this bloody pandemic and he would have been very upset to miss out on the science of a solution. Dad did indeed talk about the challenges of zoonotic disease, the growing menace of antibiotic resistance, the human quest for protein, as he put it, causing traditional methods of farming, fishing and agriculture to disappear. But during this time of global pandemic, there is good news. You are the good news. You scientists and global practitioners, whether veterinarians or medics, you hold the solution to these problems and challenges. Science will come to the rescue. I want to say a special welcome to the new Salisbury Fellows. Being a Salisbury Fellow makes you part of the Salisbury family to inquire, to learn and to act. During this time of global insecurity, we must deal with the current pandemic by embracing the concept of one world, one health. My dad also said, you learn something new every day. So over to you, the five new Salisbury Fellows. I wish you all the very best in your projects and as you travel to spread the word, one world, one health, because of course, we're all in this together. Thank you. Hello, my name is Camilla Benfield and I received a Salisbury Fellowship in 2018 for my research on peste putti ruminant virus, which as the name suggests, infects domestic small ruminants, sheep and goats, um, as well as some wild uh, ruminant species. So my research uh, took me to Tanzania to try and better understand the epidemiology of that virus at the Wildlife Livestock Interface. Uh, I went to the Sokowini University of Agriculture, tested many different um, samples from wildlife and also helped build capacity by establishing a novel diagnostic test in those labs. 
So I think the fellowship was hugely valuable, gave me a global perspective on this virus, uh, really increased my network and helped me interface actually with the policy aspects um, of this disease, which is targeted for global eradication. So just 10 days ago, I started a consultancy for the Food and Agriculture Organization to help work on the global eradication program. And certainly the fellowship, I think, um, set me in a very um, positive position for, for that new exciting opportunity. Thanks for listening. I'm Dr. Mark Nanyingi, uh, 2020 Salisbury One Health Fellow. I'm a, a postdoc research associate in One Health at the School of Public Health at the University of Nairobi in Kenya and also at the University of Liverpool in the UK. I'm investigating the occurrence of the uh, uh, Rift Valley fever virus in uh, both humans and animals. Uh, this is a virus that is transmitted uh, from mosquitoes. So I'll be investigating using a One Health surveillance system to unravel uh, the source and the, uh, the potential spread of uh, this virus between humans and livestock. At the same time, contribute to evidence to towards early warning systems for enhanced preparedness and response to early warning systems at national and global level to contain future outbreaks. The SOSB uh, Fellowship ha ha uh, has given me support actually to towards completion of my my field work in terms of uh, uh, surveillance and also sampling of, of both humans, livestock, and mosquitoes, and has created an opportunities uh, for me to a greater global health network and to become a future leader in One Health and Tropical Medicine. Thank you. My name is Lisa Cavallari. I am a veterinary epidemiologist at the University of Liverpool, and I have just been awarded a SOSB Fellowship for the year 2020. I have been working here at ILRI in Ethiopia for two years for the One Health Regional Network for the Horn of Africa. Here in Ethiopia, livelihoods are highly dependent on livestock. Livestock bring financial income, nutrients. On the downside, they can carry also zoonotic diseases. The SOSB Foundation is going to support me looking at how these contradictory effects play out, specifically for pregnant women. I hope we can very soon start data collection for this study with Addis Ababa University School of Public Health in their study site where we want to showcase One Health approaches. The SOSB Fellowship has been a huge opportunity for me. It kickstarts my project with financial support. It offers a network of peers and mentors, and I hope as many researchers as possible could benefit from it. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. My name is Juan Pablo Villanueva, and I'm a Solsby Fellow for 2020. I'm a research fellow at the Peter Doherty Institute for Infection and Immunity in Melbourne, Australia. In my project, Exploring Bhutanese Livestock and Livelihoods to Achieve Sustainable Systems, BLIS, I will collaborate with the Department of Livestock of Bhutan to investigate the milk value chain. Milk in Bhutan is a crucial product from an economic, food security, and animal human environmental health perspective. BLIS is an invitation to recalibrate One Health as a systems approach rather than a pathogen-centric approach. I'm really grateful of the support from the Salisbury Foundation for my project. As an early career researcher contributing to the emerging One Health focus of the Doherty Institute, having the support from the Salisbury Foundation to conduct my research is helping me to advance my One Health career in Australia and overseas. Hi, I'm Leon Thomas, a 2019 Salisbury Foundation Fellow working for the University of Liverpool and the International Livestock Research Institute. The Salisbury Foundation are supporting my research on food safety in the pork value chains of Nairobi. As we move towards an increasingly urbanised population of over 9 billion people, with a subsequent increased demand in animal source protein, one Health approaches are urgently needed to support the development of sustainable, secure and ultimately safe food systems. Support from the Salisbury Foundation has been invaluable in allowing me to contribute to this area of research, as well as position me to take on new challenges. I now lead a theme on neglected zoonotic diseases within the BMZ-funded One Health Centre in Africa, hosted here at Ilri. I'm excited to use this platform, as well as the network provided by the Salisbury Foundation, to build new partnerships and strengthen old ones as we use One Health solutions to tackle some of the most pressing challenges in the world today.
Thank you so much, Kate, for your very thought-provoking message from the Salisbury family. And thank you also to Camilla Benfield, Mark Nanyingi, Lisa Cavalleri, Juan Pablo Villanueva Cabezas, and Leanne Thomas for your amazing messages. As you can see, Salisbury projects are very diverse. Fellows are working in diverse countries such as Kenya, Tanzania, Ethiopia, Bhutan, Cambodia, and, and the USA, and they come from very diverse backgrounds. On our website, you can also hear from these fellows, but also from other Salisbury fellows, including Andy Stringer, who's a 2018 fellow working on antimicrobial resistance in Ethiopia. Lorena Sordo, a 2019 fellow who is studying natural disease in cats as a model of human Alzheimer's and went to the USA on her fellowship. Harriet Aute, also a 2019 fellow, helping us understand how science translates into policy in Tanzania. Kelsey Shaw, a 2020 fellow, working on Lake Victoria with snails, humans and domestic animals to understand schistosoma transmission. And Vito Colella, also a 2020 fellow from Melbourne, Australia, who is aiming to reduce hookworm infection in Cambodian villages by treating both children and dogs. These Salisbury Fellows can tell you more than anyone how winning a, a Salisbury Fellowship can open up opportunities for you that you may not otherwise have and help you to become a leader in One Health. So if you have a project in mind and the drive and determination to make it happen, I encourage you to visit the Foundation's website to learn more. Just remember, the three-month window for applications opens in just two days, the 1st of November, and closes on the 31st of January 2021. We're looking for early career researchers with medical or veterinary qualifications who are truly potential future leaders in One Health. And even if you're not at that stage in career, perhaps you're an established One Health leader, please visit our website nevertheless and consider making a donation to help us to be able to award more Salisbury Fellowships each year. And thus, you can make a direct contribution to the field of One Health. So that's salisburyfoundation.org. So finally, I'd like to thank the One Health platform once again for organising this World One Health Conference and for inviting us, the Salisbury Foundation, to take part in the opening ceremony. In the next few days, you're going to hear important updates in the field from some amazing speakers. And I wish everyone a successful and inspiring conference. Thank you very much. Thank you.